Hello, so this is a grammar for lesson 16, lecture for, uh, for January 25th. Um, so I told you that this is where it gets kind of tricky in the next few weeks. Uh, grammar 4 kind of uh, ramps up here. Um, but this week isn't terribly difficult, even though it's really important. Uh, we are just talking about the present, active, and passive infinitives. We are already very familiar with the active infinitive, the present active infinitive. Remember, that is the um, second principal part of every noun, is its present active infinitive. Okay, I'm in, here we go. Second principal part. Now, the nice thing is that to make your present active uh, infinitive passive, you're just changing out the final E for an I. So, um, amare changes to amari, monere to moneri. Um, the exception to what I just said is the third conjugation, where instead of changing it at the E out, we change whole, the whole ere out for I the letter I. So what we have here in the third conjugation is the root plus I. So instead of having the present stem plus I, we have the root plus I for the third conjugation. And then the fourth uh, conjugation is like a mo o n moneo. So it changes from audire to audiri. Um, in terms of meaning, we already know that the active means to love, to warn, to rule, to make, etc. The passive, then, as we might expect, is just to be loved, to be warned, to be ruled, etc. Okay. Now, uh, the infinitive is a verbal noun. As a noun, it is neuter, singular, and indeclinable. That'll be an important thing to remember. Neuter, singular, and indeclinable. Oh, that line did not work as I wanted it to. Okay, the infinitive can be the subject or predicate nominative, or it can be a direct object in a sentence. So, for example, in the sentence errare est humanum, to err is human, errare is the subject of est. Um, in the second sentence here, ambulare amo, I love to walk, it is the direct object of amo. And there's a little note here that is at the bottom of the page. It says the complementary infinitive is an infinitive being used as a direct object. See the second example under this sub point or this bullet. Uh, so back here, yes. Amo ambulare. So this is called a complementary infinitive. Uh, complementary from the word compleo in Latin. Sorry, comple. Um, from the verb completo, which means to fill up. So a complementary infinitive fills up and uh, completes the meaning of the main verb. Here, I love, uh, well, to walk fills out the meaning. What do you love to do? You love to walk. So most of, or many of the uses of the infinitive are going to be complementary in that sense. Okay. As verbs, infinitives have tense and voice. Uh, the present active infinitive is in is the second principal part um, and talks about its formation, but we already talked about that, so I'll let you look at that on your own. Okay, so one an another use of the infinitive. Um, it sometimes can be a subject, sometimes a predicate nominative, sometimes the direct object. Here's another use, and this is going to be a subordinate clause. It's called indirect statement. One of the way to do one of the ways to do indirect statements is with this construction, the accusative infinitive. Okay, an indirect statement is a statement reported by someone else. They are subordinate clauses and are introduced by a verb of thinking, speaking, perceiving. I would go on to say judging, feeling, etc. So words like, I see that, I think that, uh, I hear that, I feel that, um, etc. All these kinds of words can introduce that statements or indirect statements. 
So, for example, a direct statement would be, Lucy calls the people. An indirect statement, then, would be something like, I say that Lucy calls the people. In this case, I'm reporting something that Lucy said, rather than just saying what she said. So, Lucy calls versus I say that Lucy calls. In English, the main way to do this, although not the only way, but the main way is to use a that. I think of that. I feel that. I see that. All these uh, indirect statements are shown by using that. But Latin doesn't have the word for that. Um, and the way we do it instead is with an accusative infinitive. So uh, an indirect statement in Latin is indicated by the accusative infinitive construction, which one changes the verb to infinitive, and two, puts the subject in the accusative case. Hence, it got its name accusative with infinitive, or just accusative infinitive. So the way we do that in Latin, the example we gave earlier, Lucia populum vocat, that's Lucy calls the people. If I want to say, I say that Lucy calls the people, I first put dico, I say, and then we want to change the subject, Luki a to accusative, so lukiam. We leave populum in its own case because it's the direct object, and then I change the verb from vocat to vocare, the infinitive. And now the sentence reads, I say that Lucy calls the people. The verb vocat has been changed to the infinitive, and the subject has been changed to the accusative. Um, and English can also use the same construction sometimes. And I'll just point out here this little note. In indirect statements, the infinitive appears to function as a true verb and not as a verbal noun. So we're not translating it uh, to, uh, to call. We're translating it as though it were still vocat. She calls. Or Lucy calls. And that's what that uh, note is trying to let you know about. Okay. Now, uh, let's look at the second page here. A little bit more grammar. Here's another example. He is honest. That's a direct statement. I judge him to be honest. Now, in this case, we don't see the that that typically triggers an indirect statement in English. Um, instead, we have it without the that, but it's still an indirect statement set off by a word of thinking, feeling, perceiving, judging, etc. All right. Now, predicate nominatives and adjectives in indirect statements. So, you know, we said that we change the subject to the accusative case um, in an indirect statement, in, a, um, in an accusative infinitive. In agreement with that, uh, Predicate nominatives and predicate adjectives will also be in the accusative case. So, for example, um, he orders, you bet, libros, the children, to be dignos, dignified. Notice we have an accusative uh, predicate adjective and an accusative subject. Okay, a little bit of a change of pace here. Reduplicated verbs. So the first six verbs in this lesson form their third principal part, that is their perfect, by reduplicating or doubling a letter or letters in the first principal part or in the present active indicative. So, for example, let's look at these. Um, okay, cado. So cado means to fall. Uh, cadre, then we have a reduplication of the C. So we get the third principal part, kekidi. And that's what it shows you here. The ka syllable in kado has been doubled. Now it changed to an e, but uh, it's being called redoubled there. Let's see. Also with trado, trado's third principal part is tradidi. There we have the do syllable in trado has been redoubled and changed for an i. And that's a common uh, formation for the perfect tense. All right. Some more vocab notes. Uh, dedo must have an, a direct object in Latin. So you can't just say, I surrender um, without any kind of um, 
direct object. If you need one and you're wanting to say I surrender myself, you have to add the myself. So me dedo, you have to say me dedo, you can't just say dedo. Um, some other examples, he surrenders himself, say dedit, and they do it, uh, say dedunt again. All right, nokeo and persuadeo are dative verbs. They take direct object in the dative, not the accusative. You've already learned three dative uh, verbs, so prisum, desum, and apropinquo. This is where it's really important to uh, memorize as part of your dictionary form notes like this. So when it says with the dative, that means that word governs the dative case, uh, which means that its direct object will be uh, in the dative case. So the enemy harmed the soldiers, no cuerunt, uh, or hostes no cuerunt, the enemy harmed militibus in the dative. You can think of this by saying, uh, thinking about the verb as did harm to the soldiers. Um, that kind of helps you to understand why it would take the dative case. Next sentence, the orator persuaded the Senate. Uh, persua uh, so orator persuasit senatui. Okay. Uh, persuaded, convinced the Senate in the dative case. All right. So that's your lesson for the week. I will see you all on Friday, uh, where we'll do one of the translation exercises for this week's homework. Good luck.